Hello everyone, welcome to Yorkshire Gamers, a Reap Big War Games podcast and episode 21. And this is uh, being recorded on the morning of the 18th of February 2022 for release later on today. The big interview today is with Jerry Elliott or Jed Elliott of uh, War Games Holiday Centre fame. And uh, we talk about the Holiday Centre and also his uh, new setup, the Situation Room, um, which has uh, battalions with 140. 150 plus figures in and uh, is proper big gaming proper big gaming old style um so i look forward to that but before we go to the interview a little bit of housekeeping as always so interesting news or brilliant news i would uh, say is that yorkshire gamers podcast has been nominated in the caesar awards for 2022 which is absolutely amazing and i want to thank everyone who uh, nominated me um i did do a bit of begging on here and i'm i'm not afraid i'm uh, I'll, I'll beg when required uh, but uh, if you were one of the people that nominated me i'd like to thank you very very much um this podcast has been going for uh, about a year more of that in a minute and um it's i think it's a really really amazing thing to have achieved to get that nomination um after such a relatively short space of time compared to some of the other podcasts we are up against two other podcasts and uh I'd like to say they are friends of the show. Um, Two Fat Lardies, um, as you know, I'm a big fan of Rich Clark. Uh, Nick Skinner has been on here and uh, Sydney Roundwood, so uh, good luck to those guys. And uh, the other nomination is for the Plastic Practice crack podcast guys and ken and dom from uh, that show were on here on the last episode so well done to all of those and uh, may the best show win it's also would you believe nearly a year the 20th of february 2021 was the launch day of the pilot episode of this podcast um, shortly followed by episode one about a week later um but uh, we're a year old and uh, we're definitely still in nappies and we're definitely still throwing a tantrum every time thing goes wrong and uh, spitting our dummy out when we haven't got the food we want but we are a year old uh, so that is uh, fantastic and uh, there's lots of uh, things planned for the future lots of shows booked in i've got loads of guest ideas so i really don't think uh, we're going anywhere other than uh, producing a episode at least once a month sometimes twice a month and that's all down to the support of the number of people who listen to this podcast um and this clearly uh, support out there being nominated for the award so uh, so thank you once again with that nomination uh, we've got a few new listeners I've, le- I've noticed downloads going up um, over the last couple of weeks on old episodes so uh, if you're new to this podcast uh, welcome you're very welcome and uh, I thought it'd just be uh, useful to point out that um, how the release schedule uh, is supposed to work Um, it's supposed to be second and fifth Fridays of every month but we've slipped on to the third Friday of the month um, during the course of 2022 uh, just with work pressures etc but the thing to just be aware of is that this podcast is released on Podbean And Podbean is an uh, audio-only format. So it comes out on there and it automatically gets uploaded to Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, um, Spotify, TuneIn, all those sorts of uh, major podcast hosts. And then, just before the next episode comes out on audio only, then this is released on YouTube. And I will um, just put some background photographs uh, relating to my guest up in the background. And it's exactly the same recording. There's no uh, omissions or additions. And that appears on YouTube uh, normally a week before or a couple of weeks before the next episode is released on audio only. So you get your first chance of listening to it on Podbean and then some people prefer listening to it on YouTube but there is a slight delay of getting to the episode on there. So that's enough uh, chuntering on for me for now. Um, 
over to our interview with uh, with Jerry and um, we did have a little bit of a delay on the uh, internet connection between the two of us. We're not a million miles away. We're probably about 40 miles away from each other. And uh, the internet connection wasn't brilliant. Um, but that kind of led to a couple of places where we were over talking each other without realising. So I've had to cut a few bits out here and there. Um, so hopefully it hasn't spoiled your enjoyment too much. Again, the sound quality... Um, Again, it was down to the internet, any um, issues with sound levelling, etc. Um, but it was a lovely interview. It was great to have uh, Jerry on the show. Um, he really is one of the um, leading proponents of the big game. And uh, 17 years as a host at the War Games Holiday Centre and uh, his own massive War Games table with massive units now. So sit back, get yourself a cup of Yorkshire tea and uh, put your feet up and uh, enjoy the next couple of hours and I'll see you at the end of the interview. Well, welcome to the interview section of the Yorkshire Gamer podcast and we can say for the first time ever the Caesar Award nominated podcast uh, so today i'm pleased to say that my guest is a name that regular listeners to this show will be very familiar with this show is all about the larger war games table and this guy is an expert in a 28 mil horse hair field in fact if there's any justice in the world his name would be an anagram of big game we've got the war games holiday center to talk about uh, and my guest's latest monster gaming project as well, the Situation Room. If you haven't seen it on the internet, it's a joy to behold for, for us big gamers. So if I tell you that my guest uses infantry battalions of 72 to 108 figures, cavalry regiments of 144 figures, you'll know that we're not messing about with any of that skirmish game rubbish here. So I'd like to give a re big warm welcome to Jerry Elliott. Hi, Jerry. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Well, it's it's lovely to speak to you. We had a little chat before we started, and this is your first ever podcast, isn't it? it certainly is. Um, you've not even been invited before. Never, never been invited to. Well, I, I'm amazed by that, mate, because um, to many of the people who listen to this, they have fond memories of of the War Games Holiday Centre and yourself, and your name comes up quite a lot. So um, you haven't been forgotten, mate. That's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> well, the first thing that we like to do on this podcast before um, people get too comfortable is we like to do what we call the four minute challenge. And that's just for you to go and summarize your war gaming history from when you were a young lad up to today. We'll try and do it in four minutes and then we'll talk about the interesting bits later on. So how does that sound? OK, we'll give it a go. Lovely. Um, and um, as you get to the towards the end of your four minutes, the countdown clock will come in. If you if you know that show from Channel Four, okay. um, and then if you if you go too far, Di Regan from the Sweden will will tell you to shut it. So uh, okay. <laughs> so off you go, mate. I'll press the button now for your four minutes. Probably my memory starts at about five years old. It was the officer from the British Paratrooper Airfix box along with the century from the World War I British box, an old clapped out dinky toy that had no wheels, which I glued on the wheels from an old 88 tractor kit from Airfix. Oh, wow. I was five. So it was Airfix toys until I was about 11. Uh, then Hartley called War Games Club. Went there for about six months with a friend called Brendan Brown, who I still war game with. Over, that's nearly 50 years we've been war gaming now with more. Stopped going there, went back about 15, 16, then uni, and at uni I painted my first army, Han Chinese and Mongol mm. in 28. Then really it's 1981 when I saw an advert in military modelling for the War Games Holiday Centre run by PC Gilder. Yeah. Took the plunge, came down here. Ironically, it was nearly the last time I ever decided to go because two group main groups of people turned up. There was one group that came to have a good time, beer, chat, game. And of the other group, some of them, they were just there to win. And so that set a bit of a possible quandary. Um, Peter, in his own way, sorted that out quite 
Uh, some would say judiciously, some would just say arbitrarily. But <laughs> I came back, and that was the start of many, many, many years from about 1982, I think it was, thinking about yeah. it. Then in 1992, uh, Mike was having, having an issue because in 1987, Mike, uh, Peter Gilder sold it to Mike Ingham. Yeah. 1992, Mike had a personal issue going on. And um, we had something happen in family life that, to change the direction of what we were going to do. The, in a nutshell, it meant that I approached Mike to see if he wanted a business partner, came down to Scarborough, the deal was done, and then I ran it for 17 years. Mm. Um, co-owned it, co-ran it with Mike for 17 years, and then unfortunately in 2011, cancer caught him. And in essence, the previous year, he bought me back out and then with mm. all of those funds i redid a new room but in 10 mil rather than 28 mil and the war games holiday center went to basinstoke so in a nutshell there you go well that that that's super to get all that history in uh, two and a half minutes without the need for uh, the countdown music or di regan is a is a good good job there jerry so well done mate <laughs> some people some people have a lot less to say and go on for a lot longer so you, you well my background is science like i tend to write what i need to write and never anymore oh that's what I, that's what i like to hear that's what i like to hear um are you um are you from the area are you a yorkshire lad no i was born in hemel hempstead when i was eight yeah. years old moved to hartlepool and then from yeah. hartlepool at 18 went to uni in manchester uh got my honours degree and my doctorate in manchester worked with a company for nine years starting off as a senior r&d scientist Head of operations, got out the rat race, came down here and did war games as the career. Yeah. And oh, right so, work. well, who who wouldn't want that? That sounds like a perfect um, life. In essence, I retired at the age of thirty-five. I like that's what I like to hear. That's what I've missed that by twenty years already. But there we go. <laughs> so congratulations on that. Um, when you were growing up then, who were who were your hobby heroes? Who were the people that you kind of looked at and influenced how you would game in the future? There weren't any. Um, the main thing that happened was the War Games Club, because uh, that got me into Ancients. The thing about Ancients is that it seemed to be big enough because there was no one at that club that really did a lot of Napoleonics. I remember two guys who did WRG, but it always seemed to be the same thing. The Brits turn up, the French turn up, the French win, and they all put the soldiers away. All right. <laughs> so that, it never caught on to me at that that point in time with Napoleonic. So it tended to start off with ancients, but there was no one individual until I saw a military, saw the adverts of military modeling, came down, met Peter, nice guy. And it was generally it was the enthusiasm went around everyone, everyone doing it. And, and it was a big thing you could do. So that's started me getting the magazines and seeing it that way. So Peter was what got me into it in that in that sense. See, the scale of everything, um, it was always available. It was easy to ring up, find a slot on the weekend if that's what you wanted to do. So that's, but apart from that, no. So, well, I mean, Peter Gilder has been a, a common theme on here. And um, I'm not sure if you know Robbie Roddis from, he's from the Northeast. I did an episode with him. He's yes. done, yeah, he's done a lot of work as Robbie and putting together like a, an online museum for Peter with lots of, documents and stuff um so from your what was the what was the thing that gravitated people towards peter he sounds like a, i never met him unfortunately but he sounds like a charismatic guy the the first thing is is that um when he ran a game he knew he knew the rules back to front he's also one of the best gamers and those two things are really a prerequisite for anyone who wants to run a war game center yeah um and so therefore if you got stuck, you didn't have to go through a raft of rules to find out what to do. You just stuck your hand out and said, excuse me, please, so what happens in this situation? Yeah. And he would tell you what happens, and you tended to remember it because you're going through it with him because you asked the question. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's generally how it would go. And then it was after a few years that he started the connoisseur business. And on the Sunday afternoon, around about 2 o'clock, when everything had stopped, he'd bring out all the figures at the end, and people would go along with the orders, and then he would go away into the little shop. <laughs> into the garage as it was then yeah and cast up the figures for people to take away so i yeah. always remember because i, I remember i think uh, when i speak to, spoke to pete morby he had he had memories memories of going into peter's little workshop and um, learning how to to sculpt figures 
Um, was that anything you ever you, did? You ever think of uh, putting your hand to that? No. The other thing I do do remember now. You mentioned Pete. Pete would turn. I remember him turning up twice. There were two occasions. Yeah. The second one, second occasion, follows on from the comment on the first one. And Pete would turn up to say with a unit. And I remember him turning up with a unit of line lances. I can't remember there were posts. They had capsters. Fairly, yeah, they had capsters. Beautifully painted. And he was offering them to Peter to buy. And Peter got what you would call a bargain bargain basement price. <laughs> and that was the sort of thing Peter was good at. But I remember it because probably only Peter could have sort of done that. Yeah. Um, but I know I'm, I don't know if it was that unit, but he Pete did sell him one unit albeit for a good price but then pete i think sold it on for at least double the price yeah i think pete mentioned that and, and he also kind of suggested that there was a bit of um war games figures for staying at the center payment going yes. on as well yes yeah we used to do that as well people would turn up and one lad would the way we would work it is that any money that we were getting in uh, we were happy for figures yeah um, generally just pay your own hotel and yeah. then no, there's no transaction you turn up for a game oh by the way here's a few figures thank you very much play your game play your own hotel um so there was one lad he he still i still war game with him but he would turn up with a unit it was always a russian line infantry unit hmm. and, and that was his weekend oh grand sounds like so it's like a good method of uh of uh currency war games we did, it with, we did it with lots of people we did it with lots of people was was one was one Polish guard lancer? How many Russian infantry was that worth? <laughs> <laughs> well, in that time, in those times, the infantry were easy to paint because, because with yeah. the cavalry, uh, then you're going to you're talking about the realms of Doug, Doug Mason, where yeah. the the epitome of the figures were all uh, manipulated so that they're all they're all individualised. Mm. Um, he would have cut all the lances off. He would have cut the hands off, resoldered them all, and the rest of it. And the paint jobs that he, he did and still does are exquisite. Um, so it's only not to be the cavalry because that was a harder deal to do. And there were a number of people who who could get, who could copy him, yeah, as yeah. opposed to do it yourself. So uh, even now, there's Neil Sheardown who's still not going around can copy his work, and you can put the two together and you'll you'll not distinguish it. Dave Duckerty's another one. Another poor lad who was young just passed away this year. Steve Scott. I mean, he he could do the same, but. Mm. Unfortunately, he just passed away tragically. Uh, but yeah, but cavalry was always the more difficult to paint. But in terms of doing the animation, there's still very few people who can work with the soldering iron. And I know that Doug Mason for, has taught uh, Dave Doherty went over there a few times to pick mm. up all load of tricks in the trade because Dave Doherty still does a lot of work with things like Sudan and other things. Yeah, he's. Um, I know Dave, and he's he 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 does love a camel, does our Dave? He, he's. he's <laughs> <laughs> he's certainly the premier camel painter in the uk i would suggest well i still talk to carlo because he does San Sudan. sudan so dave yeah. does that he's got the big layout yeah he was inspired from peter and carlo was inspired so what carlo did he tried to got together all the information he could about the rules peter used to use and i saw some for him as well and then he he wrote them and then I edited it for him, and then he published them. So that's back in the domain. Yeah, is that Carlo Pagano? Is Pagano. it the? Yeah, yeah he's 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 on my he's list. Up. He's on my list to come on the show. So uh, he's um, well worth it, big Aussie. Yeah, because when we, when we have the when we have these chats at the start of the show, this is where the names come up, and this is where your name has come up on a number of occasions. Um, so what's your was your gaming before the holiday centre then that was at the Hartley Pool Club then two How three years but so I've probably finished that in 74 mm. possibly in the 75 and that was the last time I wore game there and have you ever gone back to club gaming or has it always been your own thing no it's always been my own thing shows and shows and putting displays on has that ever been your your thing displays no because it's it's a lot of hard work for no real reward um yeah and the other thing you have to be a bit mindful that if you take all your wares down there is always conscious you don't want anything unsavory to happen with someone thinking oh all of this stuff is available yeah the main good thing you have for protection is that they can't use the stuff anywhere else in public because it's just so recognizable yeah and that's the same now even if the war game solidly center and lots of people's personal collections you could they could never be used 
because everyone just recognises where they came from. Those signature units, isn't there? The, the, the Zastro and Karas style. and people like you. You could never sell that, could you? And, and style. I don't think there is anybody else still in the country doing it as madly as I'm doing, mm. placing so many figures into a unit. I mean, the Austrian Hussars, for example, they're 192 troopers. 100? Oh, well, I was un underestimated you there. <laughs> underestimated you. Full eight squadrons. <laughs> <laughs> the Brits well, have just been finished. The British Guard yeah. unit, there are 160 men. Wow, this is what we like to see. Well, we'll chat. We'll chat more um, about your Situation Room stuff uh, towards the end of the show. Um, uh, but what in in all the gaming that you've done, um, what would sort of boil down to? I think I can guess your favourite period. Um, but you've mixed around with scale. So what would, we'll start with your favourite period. What's your what do you love to game? Napoleon. Yeah. And what's the what's the drive behind that? What's the factors that make that the standout period? It's a nice game of chess. The, the variable, for me, it looks good. It's mm. got a nice feel. You've got big guns, little muskets, cavalry, mm. supposedly. But in terms of when you, in your mind, when you're playing through how you do it, it to me, it's a good game of chess. You can actually mm. play, to some extent, you can play to the rules, more often than not, over, the more experience you get, you actually end up playing the player as well in terms of psychology. So when you've seen players many, many times over many, many years, you know what they're going to do, you know the, how, how they're going to do it, and so you <laughs> react to it. And Napoleonics makes it easier to see that happen and bring it to fruition. Mm. The other period that's popular, World War II, less so, because too many things can go wrong. Even when you've done everything in your mind correctly, it can still go horribly wrong um so but it works but the key things i have always looked at was any period there are two two ingredients it requires one of them it has to be exciting now mm. when i first came to napoleonics wrg sort of left me cold it was everyone yeah. lined up he rolled a d6 somebody said something and that was it packed the troops away you played the grand manor you got you you got your bucket of 64 dice for <laughs> your cavalry knives and that brings home the excitement bit and then the next thing is, is that when the game's finished and guys are going away, you've won when they think they've actually played that battle. So if you suddenly say you've got on the Battle of Waterloo, for example, afterwards they go away thinking in their minds, I, I've just fought the Battle of Waterloo. Yeah. And it's exciting. Then you can virtually guarantee out of all of those people, 80% of them will return to another game. And that's, that's how you do it. Chose the periods for me to do. So American Civil War is the other one using fire and fury but fire and fury uh have to be changed they use a single d10 system i don't care what anyone says it doesn't work because yeah. you, get, you get too much of a variation you need to average it out there's a way we do that so they've been tinkered with and ironed out things the way i perceive it should be done and that's another one that you can make exciting the guys go away thinking yeah i fought that battle then they come back again do you find the balance of the different elements of Napoleonics one of the things that makes it exciting? The fact that everything you don't have a um, like an American Civil War, for example, the infantry and, and the musket is, is king over the cavalry. Your cavalry is over there somewhere getting off its horse, firing its carbine. Whereas in Napoleonics, you've got that rock, paper, scissors thing with the elements involved. Yes. The, the, the one thing i will say though is that all, most of my experience for all, many of those years was with in the grand manor mm. and the thing about in the grand manor is that it was very difficult to recreate certain specific uh, situations like plant and one will be a good one where you've say you've got prussian land there throwing itself against a, a couple of guard units what would happen there is is that in the first round of the battle first assault the french guard will win the problem after that is the French have lost numbers and eventually it becomes attritional. Hmm. Now, when you go to another set of rules like Empire, Empire bring in this facility that says you do get brigades that can hold up whole divisions of corps hmm. through their quality. Yeah. And it, it did it in a slightly different thing. So I then went forward to what I do and I, I try to marry those two aspects together. So now we can get a plant and wire where you can have good quality troops and it will hold out all day against poor quality troops. Oh, well, yes, yeah, that sounds good. The differentiation of the quality you get brings in the colour bit. Plus, you can always vary it from game to game. So in one yeah. battle, you can have 
Prussian land there with a morale of one, but if you fight in 1813 and defense as a homeland, you can give them the base morale of three, but mm. they still fight poorly as they are trained. So you have got all that variation. So yes, but I do like. Brilliant. Um, so a lot of the things that we talk about in the start, we're going to talk about in other sections. So um, the last bit I'm going to talk about in, in the introduction is something I call the Venn diagram of wargaming. And that's, you remember Venn diagrams, you're a scientist, you should, uh, should remember them. Many, many, many moons ago, <laughs> mainly with mathematics. Yeah, well, all, all I've done is, um, so the, the four areas I've put it into are wargamer, painter, collector, and historian. And some people prefer to paint, some people prefer to game, and they're not that bothered about the painting. Some people aren't bothered about history. It's just an interesting way of putting those various sectors together to see what your world games personality is like. So how would you see yourself fitting in those categories, the war game of painter, collector, historian? I'm a war gamer. <laughs> as easy as that. Yeah, then what, what happens is, is that when you, as you say, over years, you fight battles and you see the outcome, you think, well, OK, I've fought this battle of Waterloo and I've done this, this and this. You then read about the battle and you see things that are common and you see things that are different and when you see things especially that are different it makes you sometimes curious to, to, to dig a bit yeah. and then see how do the rules mimic it or is it something that can't possibly happen in the rules and the rest of it so it was war gaming but that drove me to do some historical reading to find out what yeah. went on so that i could modify how i viewed how the rules would do to mimic actually what appeared to be happening yeah, painting I don't do. I haven't got the patience. I haven't mm. got the skill either. So that yeah. doesn't happen. Uh, collector, not just for a means to earn. No, I get the yeah. figures because I want to use the figures. So they, the, um, because I, I had this discussion with Simon Hall, who's written a, written a few war games rules, and he was saying that he wasn't a collector, and he was sat in a room very similar to yourself with, I think he said about forty thousand figures behind him. And I, and I said, pull the other one, mate. You, you are definitely a collector with the, that number of figures behind you. What, what do you think, what would you say was your total, you know, how many figures have you got as a collection? Over 100,000. Comfortably. Comfortably. Yeah. So that, that, that it's difficult to deny the collector side of things there. But it's not why you do it. I mean, it's, yeah. when you, it, if you when I step back when when I was doing, started doing my own thing in a situation room, not too long a story, but it's a story. I, I ended up thinking I'm going to have 108 figures as opposed to the 36 for a standard French column, hmm. and then worked on that basis. By the time you've got an army big enough to fight a decent battle, you've got 15,000 figures to begin with. Yeah, you then flesh it out to do anything you possibly want to, including all the Allies. Then the French are nearly 30,000 figures, and you do hmm. the same for the Austrians, then the Russians. Then you do the Prussians, then you do the British and all the Allies. They yeah. just accumulate. And do you, do you do you do any any type of gaming outside the larger game, or is, you know do you ever just hunker down on a six by four and, and try something on there? No. Or it, it, no, it's all the big stuff. If, I'll like. go where I'm invited. If I'm invited somewhere in the table smaller, then that's fine because it's all about always about then the social aspect. Because um, my wife has never war gamed in her life, can stand war game the rest of it. Mm. She's the people I game with are as much her social friends as they are my social friends. So Frank, we're just back from Vienna. So one guy you definitely want to get on is called Andy JQ. That's his he, site. Yeah, name. yeah, I've seen his setup. The reason we went there this time, it was a, a tribute game to Herbert Gratz. Yeah. Herbert Gratz is well known by lots and lots of people. Died suddenly mm. and unexpectedly. I'd known Herbert for over 30 odd years. Mm. And they have their own setup in Vienna. Yeah. It's a permanent setup. They, they leased the basement in the building. It's near the embassy quarter in Vienna. You just walk around the corner, you can see the guards outside the French embassy. <laughs> um, and we went there. Four, three, some of us from the UK went over and um, celebrate Herbert, go and see his grave, meet his family, and play a war game. So we played Borodino um, out each evening. So these guys are friends. I've known two others of them, I've known for nearly just as long, at least 25 years. Mm. So yes, I get around when I'm invited, and then when I'm invited, <laughs> I don't care what size the table because it's yes. it's not totally part of it. It's not the the end of it if you see what I mean. So if there's if there's free beer and a curry, then you're there, whatever it is. 
But that's what we do here. So, for yeah, example, yeah. I've got a week starting Sunday. The guys from Austria are coming over. Oh, brilliant. There are 10 of us gaming. They book the hotel. We arrange the restaurants. Uh, Anne will do all the lunches. And it's free beer. Excellent. That's what we like to and, hear. That's pro- proper war gaming, that is. And for the Austrians, free port. Oh, my word. <laughs> you, you are spoiling them. Yes, I like that. You know, you notice what tipples they like. But they're good because... <laughs> When we were there, Andreas, he took us for the tour of the Wagram battlefield. And yeah. that's just an eye-opener. When you see the real battlefields, it's a real eye-opener as to what a war gamer perceives a real battle is and what you mm. can see and what you can't see. And the reality when you get there, completely two different things. And that's the historian part, because it allows, yeah. makes you think, I'm playing a game that says you do this, this, and this. Mm. How do I know I can do this, this, and this? Mm. Should it be, you know... And so when you see these battlefields, it answers a lot of questions, but it also then raises more questions you never even thought. And all that all that drive for you then is to get a better game at the end of it or a more realistic exactly. game. And immerse myself in the thought afterwards that, that I was I was there, I was fighting it, I was issuing orders, and I couldn't control everything. It wasn't all in my control. It helps with the immersion into the whole sort of hobby and experience for me. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for that, Jerry. That will do for our introduction. And we'll just take a short pause in the recording and uh, we'll be back shortly to talk about your history with the War Games Holiday Centre. Okay, uh, we're back for the second part. And in this part, regular listeners all know that we normally talk about big games and uh, because Jerry does a lot of big games uh, we're going to just talk about the War Games Holiday Centre in this section and um, we, we talked about it briefly in, in the introduction um, but what do you remember of the first time that you ever walked into Peter's War Games Holiday Centre what was your what's your lasting memory of that it was the size it wasn't primarily the length it was the depth because in your mind's eye, you can imagine a table 24 foot long or whatever it is, but at the centre it was 28. But it's the it's the depth that then starts to throw you that you get, and it makes it look a lot, lot, lot bigger. Um, because then you think, well, okay, it's not literally just two armies lined up toe to toe and they're going to have a little fight and one wins, one loses. The idea of reserves comes in, it immediately strikes your head that you can have a first line, second line, however you want to think mm. of it. So it was that. It was just just the size of it. And had you seen had, had you seen anything comparable to that? No. At that never. time, never. I hadn't even been to a war game show. So so it was quite a, a a large immersion into the hobby then. Yeah, because I went, we went there, and then I think the month after, because it was held in the latter part of the year. Uh, not, I was living in Oldham at that time, and that's when Northern Military used to be. Yeah, I used to go to that. I went yeah. to Northern Military. Mm. That was the first war game show I ever went to. And then and as just, soon as I went to the show and saw the games, that then put more into perspective what Peter was doing in isolation down, down here, you see. Yeah. And nobody else could do it, anywhere near do it. And what was that? What was the table set up, um, just for people who might not be familiar? Um, was it the, the one that I was familiar with uh, where you are now or next door to where you are now with the central table and then like reinforcement tables either side there were two tables if you two remember. tables yeah there was yeah there is, two think, so everything everything was 27 foot long 28 foot long i keep having the extra foot yeah you walked in, on on the right hand side facing his kitchen window was where the window line was yeah and that was a single three foot table then you had a three foot gap then you had a six foot width table then you had a two and a half foot gap, and then you had another six foot table. Yeah. And then behind that, you had all the cupboards where all the figures were stored with no windows on that wall. And when it was, that... it was a garage, yeah. it was a garage, it was a modular garage. Um, I've yeah. forgotten the name of that manufacturer, but that's how it was constructed. And when, so that, that mood, that was the, was it the Enchanted Cottage? He was at the Enchanted Cottage, yeah. The first one. So when did that move then to, um, Thornton Ladale or Flockton? No, so Thornton Ladale first, and then it from Thornton ah, Ladale right. moved to Enchanted Charlie Cottage. Right, okay. Well, well, when was that move? My, I'm guessing, I think it was 81. And uh, do you, were you regularly attending then as a, as, a, as a customer, if you like? 
from 82 onwards. Yeah. And uh, how often would you go? Uh, first year I went once. Second year, I think I did two weekends in a week. And then after that, I was doing upwards of three, four weekends in a week. Every year? Every year. Always always Napoleonics? Yes. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. And I never did... I never did general week because I wasn't interested in doing Italian wars. I wasn't interested in the American Civil War. I wasn't interested in doing World War II. It was always Napoleonics. It was always Napoleonic. And did you um, did you strap uh, a particular flag to your flagpole? You were always French, always British, always uh, Austrians, or you'd, you'd mix around? You used to like French, but after a few years, you didn't mind. Um, especially when Mike took over, Mike Ingham took over. It, it was whatever balanced the sides. There was, yeah, there was, there was, there's a bit of a rumor going around that Peter Gilder was a bit pro French, and, and, and oh, may I have... say that, <laughs> but he never, he never overtly interfered in the game. He would, try, yeah. he would come along and try and wind you up by saying, "Oh, you, you've done that, you've lost." Yeah, <laughs> you just look at Peter and say, "Oh, okay." But you'd end up, you, you didn't lose, so no, you took that with a pinch of salt. Did you? Peter oh, always right. claimed. Peter always claimed that all he needed was two squadrons of guard lancers and the guard horse up, guard horse battery, and he could roll up virtually any any position. Yeah, was, that's a, good, good bullshit. Yeah. But. yeah. <laughs> well, there's some classic classic units there, definitely. So, definitely. how did you go then from being um, a member of the public, going along and taking part in these games, to becoming involved in it as a business? Well, in 87, he sold it to Mike Ingham because Peter wanted to concentrate on the figures. Because war games, war games, you, can, you can't make a living out of it. Anyone who's tried it has failed, always has yeah. failed, always yeah. will fail. You can't make yeah. the money. You have to take it on as, as a hobby. And if you make some money out of it, great. But you don't yeah. do it going and think, I'm going to make a business out of it, because you can't. Even now, don't care who they are, you can't do it. Yeah. Um, Mike Ingham was in a position where he was at 33 and he finished work. He had all the money mm. he needed, bought Peter out in cash in a suitcase. There you go. Oh, nice. <laughs> so um, his initial view is completely different. Um, and then he had a personal issue come sort of 91, 92. And it, it dovetailed with uh, my nephew's friend who was 12 effectively diagnosed with a brain tumour, dead within five weeks. We have a thing of saying, well, what are we doing with our lives? Mm. And it was my wife who sort of suggested, you know, you've always thought this idea about running a war game solidly sense. So why don't you see if it's possible? Knowing my situation, we, we talked to him, and that's how it started off. Mm. But knowing that it's never going to make money. So I did that, and my wife came down to work here because she's a speech therapist. She mm. works with adults with learning disabilities. Um, so she started off with a job down in Bridlington and we came over, lock, stop and bound, mm. just took the risk. Here we go, yeah. and whoosh, jump. Yeah. And that was in so, December 1992. Sometimes those decisions are the best ones that you can make, aren't they? Yeah. Did you know Mike I mean, before then? I knew from, I knew the first time I met him was the year he was buying off Peter. And that was the very, very last game Peter ever did. And that's when I met him. And it was a battle of mm. Salamanca. I remember mm. that. And bizarrely, um, also Mark Freeth was there, who's now got the War Games Holiday Centre. Yeah, Mark's been on the show as well uh, in in the past. Um, so we've we've got our full collection of War Games Holiday Centre people. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like one of those sticker albums that you used to get as a kid with the football players in. Yeah. Um, I was here. <laughs> I was here. <laughs> so. When you when you did get involved then as a business, what was your sort of day to day involvement with the centre? Oh, we're just equal business partners. Uh, Mike's interest would be possibly setting the game up and the rest of it. I got interested in doing little bits of terrain, so which is still down at uh, Basingstoke, I think at least half a dozen or more. Um, I took it. I didn't say I took over because it was my interest. The buildings that down, are down there, which are largely mixed soil buildings, certainly mm. with the World War II and most of the polyonics, was through a relationship I got going with mixed soil to get all of that done. And that's what I used to do. I used to build around it. When funds were available, it was padding out the extra terrain we needed, that type of thing, because that was my interest. Mike's 
happy as Larry because it's getting done and he can so we were both able to do what we wanted to do and we didn't so we never actually ended up stepping on anybody's toes because we just did mm. what we wanted to do um we, you never sort of sat there and thinking oh you know I've done 20 hours this week and he's only done three. it never came up it just wasn't of no interest it's, and that's the reason that it worked so well for 17 years is that you mm. you did it because you wanted to do it it's yeah. for fun it's it's because you like seeing the hobby and we made some money out of it so that was like mm. a side issue if you see what I mean so what would you do what would your role be on on a weekend then when you've got gamers in or on a week when you've got gamers in are you are you kind of the the umpire the genial host yeah, umpire. how did you kind of fit in well the umpire so uh probably for the first normally on the friday night what happened was we'd meet them at the hotel have an evening meal then come out for about three years mike and i did that his wife margaret would come along for about after that, it tends to be more me because Mike also had another interest in playing bridge. So that was mm. fine. And then Saturday and Sunday, it would tend to be on a Saturday, I'd probably get up first and go down. They'd all come in, get everything kicked off and the rest of it. And on mm. Sunday, it would, Mike would turn up first. So both yeah. get, to get a line in over the weekend type thing. So what would happen is we'd both be there to go and be off. Mike would say, oh, I'll go and do something. Fair enough. After about an hour and a half, he'd come back down. I'd nip off for an hour. So there was always an umpire there. And did you, did you, kind of miss playing the games when you yeah. were umpiring yeah did you you're ever dying to sort of, you're dying to sort of say to someone don't do that please don't do that. <laughs> no don't do that no 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 you're about to, you're about to push defeat from the jaws of victory no don't no 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 don't do that yeah. don't, don't, don't. but you didn't did you ever did you ever take a crafty cavalry corps if somebody didn't turn up yes oh excellent that's what i like to hear but then you to, to make it fair you would have to actually um insist on orders as to what you were to do yeah so there was a wagram in fact where they said I, that i had to play uh Devu on the french left me knowing that two austrian corps are going to come on its flank immediately so you ask for specific orders of what the task is yeah and then you just carry it out now when when the when the trap is sprung if I can extricate myself from the trap, then fair enough. But you mm. don't. I don't preempt it by saying I know that's going to happen, so I'll, I will artificially do it. So you have to play the character that you're supposed to be doing to do mm. it. Um, but most times, if you were doing it, you would try and do it so you were shuffling troops at the back, so they could yep. do the fighting. Uh, this was Earth Corps going over there, so you yep. you might move the figures for them make sure they haven't forgot to move them and let them do the fighting so you, most of your time if you did it you'd be, you'd be doing that yeah and how did you i always find this interesting people who've done wargaming as as a full-time thing of as did you ever lose the enjoyment of it because many people have the, the hobby is something that they go to after work etc to release steam does no. it ever become a grind it was always no the the boyhood dream that came true the hobby would never come out a grind there'd be certain in, individuals that i was lucky could potentially push buttons to sort of wind you up a bit but funny enough it used to be mike that would break first before me um right <laughs> in the 17 years we worked together it really only happened twice and did, did you find in general then that the um that the people who came to the war game center were as we, we talked earlier on about your first experience were they from that come and enjoy the game and have a have a good time kind of game or, or more of the majority. competitive winner majority but if you find a competitive one it was dead dead easy to sort that out it was is the easiest thing in the world <laughs> um and word would get around over the years which it did yeah if someone was yeah. getting either aggressive or say they're trying to be pushy because maybe their opponent is not not fully aware of how things work if they're two competent players the one who is being bullish you just sat next to him yeah that's all you did you just sat yeah. there watch yeah. the game watch the game so yeah. they're not quite going right say oh don't don't forget that that happens don't forget that's all you do <laughs> and it's suddenly dawning and that if you calm down a bit and just do it as you probably started off doing it i'll bugger off i'll go somewhere else yeah which you, and if you don't I'll, I'll just sit there and watch everything that goes on watch yeah 
for the guy who wasn't very good, who had a good opponent, and it was just sitting with him and saying, with the, get a piece of paper out and say, in your mind's eye, imagine these are big divisions or whatever. How do you think you might try and do it? Mm. And bizarrely, you sometimes find that on a piece of paper, they can draw out roughly what to do. So you just say, mm. well, do the same thing now and see if it works. So I think I think a lot of people come into the War Games Holiday Centre, certainly for the first time, um, can be overawed, can't they, with the, the volume of troops. If they're and, brand new, you don't leave them. You, what you do is you sit yeah. with them, you help get the troops out. You get them, normally you get them at least to the first firing phase. Then you come back on the second turn, making sure they're doing things are going okay. And you just sort of say, everything okay? Do you need, do you need anything confusing you? Do you need a lift? Or you, then you say, Oh, I see. He's, he's trying to drive in your right flank. Well, what are you going to do about? What do you think you might do about that? And leave it that. Leave it at that. Yeah, there's another war gamer, uh, an old Bilson, which he might have, might have come up mm. in your conversation. Yeah, he hated it when I did that. <laughs> did he? Yeah, he'd be going forward with a full array of his corps, ready to do, deal death <laughs> and destruction to his opponent. And I go and sit next to his opponent and say, "Oh, what's Noel doing over here?" <laughs> Noel's going. With expletives and yeah, ooh, ooh, how do you think you might manage to do that? Uh, no, oh. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to get a bottle and put you on the head. <laughs> That's what you do. But yeah. all just to keep everyone in it, keep everything going, no and, fight. Yeah. And did you, or I, I take it you, you built on the collections of figures that you inherited? The, the war game centre. When we yeah. started, when by the time we'd finished stuff. Mike and I had finished after 17 years, at least two and a half times the number of figures there. The World War II virtually didn't exist when we started, which was then significant, and the American Civil War didn't exist at all. There were, there was was, that, there were yeah, some cavalry was... units, we spoke cavalry units, but that was mm. it. There was nothing that you could call, you, you couldn't really play a proper game with it. There was virtually nothing to do. So all of that was completely done by Mike and myself. And um, all brought in through external painters? Commissioned the painting. Commission, yeah. Again, like Pete. See, one of the things I, I learned two things of Pete. So, Pete, there are people out there who want to do it because they quite love it as well, and you get a good price. Um, keep things simple. Yeah. If you have a look at the terrain, any terrain Pete had made, the, the first thing is, is simplicity. If it's not simple, Peter wasn't interested. It has to be simple, can't do too, too complex. And I, I picked that up off him immediately. So, um, yeah, that's so like if it's Napoleonic figures, it was Pete Morby, yeah. Um, yeah. simply because it was, um, <laughs> what discount you giving us, Pete? <laughs> I get the answer I wanted. It helped him, helped us. First, uh, American Civil War was first call. They did the same. World War Two. There were two companies, and I've forgotten their names now because there's one near in Hampshire somewhere, and there's one in near Manchester. Mm. One in Manchester used to do the, all the resin kits. He was the first one to do the nice detailed resin kits, but partly with metal bits. Hmm. So if you've got a Panzer IV, the, the chassis would be the resin, but the, the side skirts, if you wanted, the H model would be metal. Yeah. I've forgotten his name now. But Was that in 20 mil? Uh, they were in 20s, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. And the American Civil War 28s and Polyon 28s. But everyone we went to, um, it would be also, okay, I'd like a good discount and the retort was low okay, tech, what sort of war do you want? Well, well, let's start at a thousand figures and then see if that suits. And that's how we would do it and get a relationship going that way. So afterwards, yeah. Pete didn't care what size the order was. We'd always get the discount because he'd had thousands of figures yeah. being sourced yeah. off him. I always liked Pete's figures because although by today's modern standards, they're maybe not as detailed as um, something you can buy today in plastic or similar. There's a, there's, um, and it's hard to explain, there's a life about Pete's figures. The, 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 when you, the, when, the, when they're together in a unit across the table, they just look amazing. Well, there's a, the jury's going to be out on uh, the plastic figures for, uh, what, another 10 years? To see how the yeah. plastic comes up over, over, the, over time? Yeah. Does it vitrify? Does it oxidise? What does it do? Because it of, some, something that you'll be um, familiar with, and you might be able to tell us how you dealt with this, when 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 I put a, a big game on here at, uh, at my place, there's always going to be flags that come off, arms that come off, heads that come off. Um, Repaired on a Monday morning. Was that was that Monday morning on the list every week? Yes. Repair weekends breakages. Always repaired immediately. 
it never took me to, it then would never take me more than two hours on a monday ever to repair things and was it was it a common thing or had you had you done something with the, with the figures to make sure that stuff no. didn't fall off no the, the key thing is when you repair is um, glue goes nowhere near it glue never touched the figure yeah they were all soldered everything was soldered all oh, right that that'll be why things don't fall off though <laughs> again that's what i did learn off Buck mason so everything was soldered flags were soldered on everything was soldered on no glue mm. well um soldering iron wouldn't work particularly well on plastic figures i would suggest nope. <laughs> although some people do do it all oh, right i'll be a, a very very low solder i suppose I'm, I'm not sure exactly how they do do it and then again little tricks doug used to use heat sinks so you, you can to stretch things so you can use heat sinks so you can stretch solder Oh, but that was a rule. Okay. That was a rule. Monday morning, all the repairs go in, they all get done, then it's never more than two hour job. Yeah. Never never let it accumulate. Well, yeah, I could imagine with with all those figures, it would um if you, if you left it one week, then two hours becomes four hours, becomes a day, becomes uh and you'd never get on top of it, would you? Plus then when you saw figures that you thought were gonna slightly go, say the legs of a horse, and you saw it during the during the game, you take it out, you actually redo that. I would say on average of maybe anywhere between two and five repairs were required after a weekend. Yeah. So in those in those seventeen years then, what were the what were the best games to run? What were the the battles that every time it was a corker? Uh, it wasn't probably the game, it's probably the group of people. If you've got a group of people who they're all nice. It's just that when you get people not experienced, you spend more time trying to make the game um go smoothly. You get people who are experienced. You're able to spend more time just sat back watching how they're doing it and yeah. cursing at each other, jumping up and down, <laughs> cheering. I need another beer. Going well, we didn't do beer at that time, but then yeah, so that was it. So yeah, was it mostly groups who came then? Of, or did was the weeks where you would have odd people here and there who hadn't met before? As time went on, after about five years, it got split because we'd have private weekends. So. When we advertised the private weekends, we went on the advert. So that mm. meant the ones that on the advert, you could get people from private weekends even come into a one-off weekend because that's what they wanted to do. Yeah. So you would have like two groups, groups that didn't know each other beforehand, but might know each other when they turned up. Ah, oh, nice to see you again, type thing. Yeah. And then groups. About oh. 2009, 2008, 2009, I must have had 16 private events going on. Because I think the, uh, the the lads from the Leeds War Games Club that I go to were at least once, if not twice a year, would would come for a weekend. Is that and Richard? Would, in his group? Richard Harris and uh, Richard Croisdale and and all those guys, uh, and they would they would come. I think at least twice a year for a weekend. And they were a novelty as well because they they like playing rapid fire. Yes, they still do. <laughs> you, you won't get me anywhere near rapid fire. <laughs> It won't that... happen. The unusual thing about uh, their games is when they came down, we made a point is we would never umpire them because we didn't know the rules at all. So effectively, they had to centre any of the figures they needed access to. We do the lunches, teas and the coffees, and then they police themselves because we we didn't know the rules. Yeah. Well, do you know Richard's got his own little yeah. war games weekend yeah. thing now. Looks great. Um, but, so what uh... what were your what were your sort of Fond memories of that time then, of those 17 years. No pressure. Mm -hmm. It's been relaxed. That's why I put so much weight on. Enjoyed it that much. Yeah, but I'm also lucky. It's the side effects of that is, I mean, I was able to follow my son through all his schools, being a school governor, chair of governors at the primary school. So mm -hmm. I, I got involved in the community indirectly through actually coming down over to do the war gaming. He's doing that. And it's me adding something back, if you like, to my expertise into into the skill the school yeah. used to love me. <laughs> brilliant um so uh, sadly all good things come to an end so what was the was was it mike sadly passing away that was kind of the end of the time at the war games holiday center no he'd bought you out yes. hadn't he beforehand so the year before he died he bought me out so in, in in running all those games in the holiday center then obviously you become extremely experienced in in running big games you've, you've talked about some of the ways that you did that and the ways that you helped newer players and 
and maybe put off the more experienced players. Um, what what to you were the what to you were the key elements then of making a big game work for 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 people? Had to be exciting, and when they played it, they had to say that was the battle of whatever that I fought. Get those two ingredients right, they're going to come back. And did that did that take a lot of planning to get that to happen? No. Um, for me, the nice thing is when I started doing it, I'd be looking for Mike for the lead, see how Mike did things, because Mike was a very good host, mm. um, very attentive, knew the rules back to front, very good at adjudicating. And you watch, you learn, you listen. After, you know, however long it took, probably two years or whatever, you, you're in doing it yourself and with the same level of confidence. And, mm. and you, you don't look back. It's like swimming. Once you've done it, you never lose it. <laughs> and, and does there have to be an element of showman in it? No. To keep, no. No. You, Sometimes think... they look to you for the guidance. They say to you, what do you want to do here? Yeah. Uh, one little trick they used to have is that if I was umpiring, someone might say to me, uh, Jerry, the situation's arrived, at risen in this village. Uh, what do we do? And I would say, you do this, this, and this. Mm. If Mike was umpiring, they might say, Mike, there's a situation at the village. What do we do? This, this, mm. and this. And some of them used to get cute because it is true <laughs> to the sense that Mike and I sometimes favoured one interpretation against another interpretation. Yeah. But the key thing we did is that the first thing is we, we came and they said, what happens here? The first thing I would ask is, has a ruling already been made? Oh, we never, con <laughs> we never contradicted each other <laughs> because some of them used to get quite cute and it came again. It was for fun. They were doing it for fun. They were, they were testing us to see whether one of us would be tempted to overrule the other one. <laughs> no, it didn't, didn't work. <laughs> that was so what, that happened yeah. a few times. That was, a few, well, that's absolutely that was fun. That was fun. Because we were doing, doing a bit of game. And they were, they were the experienced players. And they would mm. turn around to the newbies and say, told you, they won't contradict each other. <laughs> oh, well, that's brilliant. Well, thanks for talking about your time at the War Games Holiday Centre, Jerry. That was really interesting. Um, and uh, we'll have another short break uh, for everyone listening. And we'll be back in a second with our world-famous quiz. If there's one thing that's going to get me into trouble, it's the Yorkshire Gamer Quiz. And uh, as be as we always have to do, we always have to put a little bit of a disclaimer at the start for people who get upset with things. And uh, this is uh, how Yorkshire Gamer you are test. None of these are right or wrong. Um, it's just a bit of a way of uh, getting some conversation going uh, very quickly over a period of time. So, Jerry, there's, uh, there's 20 questions and um, mm. they're, they're, either, they're either yes or no um or one or the other um you will uh being from yorkshire you will notice some regional bias in some of the questions that is is not hidden at all um so there may be some clues to the right answer in some of these questions okay. um and as i say as they say to the kids today there is no right and wrong there's just an answer so um we'll get any if you need an explanation i'll explain no problems at all so question one i think i know the answer to this one Go big or go home? Go big. Go big. That's what we like to hear on the show. Um, as you don't paint, you might not get this one. So uh, contrast paints, are they great or a gimmick? They're good if they're done correctly. Oh, I like that. I like that one. Um, paint brushes, um, Windsor and Newton or Yorkshire made pro art? Windsor and Newton. Oh, Jerry, you let me down. You live in Yorkshire, lad. But <laughs> well, the thing is, you're the one I've never come across them. But are they sable? Uh, they do sable. Yeah, the, the maiden skipped them. The maiden skipped them. Oh, they might be okay then. They're, they're brilliant. I've used them for 30 odd years, mate. They're absolutely I've never, heard, never heard of them. Oh. Well, it's their fault. If they don't get them stuck in Scarborough, then they can. Right. I'm going to go and see them and have a chat. So I'll, I'll get you shopping, Scarborough. Right. So um... does, Dave, does Dave Doherty use them? Oh, he, he uses some rat air thing, does Dave? He's, well, he's they camel do. air. They, if, they, if they send to him and David endorses them, Dave's got a following of about 14,000 on the painting side. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I, I know Dave. I'll say, I, I don't know what brushes he uses, actually. I'll, I'll have to have a chat with him. He's on my list to come on the show, but um, he's not as popular as you are, Jerry, so he's not been on. He, he, I'll tell him that on Sunday he's here. <laughs> <laughs> 
That is he. Yeah. Bless him. Bless him. That's you getting shot. Yeah, again. Again. <laughs> so um this the this one's an interesting one. Ninety-six figures. Is that an army or a unit of pike? It's neither. It's too small for a unit of pike. Too small. I'm going to give you an extra mark for that one. Um, a six by four table. Is that a big or a small game? Small game. You are preparing a, a game. Uh, would you use points or an historical order of battle? Historical order of battle. Oh, we're doing well here, Jerry. We're doing well. Um, when you're painting, and again, you're not a painter, so I don't know how this will go. Um, you would you use a wet palette? Or an old bit of MDF to mix your paints on? Uh, old bit of MDF. Because yeah, really do you have to mix really do really do you have to mix palettes? Because if you're doing layering, you do one colour down to the other. If you mix and you come to repairs, for example, ah, it, makes life difficult. it makes life difficult because you've then got to try and find the shade. If you keep it to a discrete colour and rely on the shade subtle shading, you've actually got the paint palette that you need exactly there hundred percent of the time. Uh, good idea. Well done. Well done. Um, unfortunately, this is painted again. If you were undercoating figures, would you go black or white? Black. Oh, excellent. Regionally biased question warning. Um, if you offered a drink, would you have Yorkshire tea or dirty mucky coffee? Yorkshire tea. Oh, you see, you see, this is going well. This is. We're on for. We're on for. A, we're halfway through. We could be on for a, a best of a score here. Um, war game war game units um if if it's historically accurate do you like the figures to be tightly packed or socially distanced tightly packed tightly packed an easy one for you this one uh two hour club game or a weekend monster game a, a week monster game which is what happens on sunday brilliant that's what i like to hear that's what i like to hear um, this is uh, one of the honorary questions. We have questions in honor of uh, previous guests. And this one is our Nick Skinner from Two Fat Lardies question. Uh, and this is um, avocado. Is it just posh, mushy peas? No. No? Oh, you, you're, you're in the avocado camp. No, I like avocado. Oh, dear me, dear me. Um, you can do a lot with avocado. Yeah, it, it, look, it looks like mushy peas. <laughs> Next to be telling me that people that must eat mushy peas think guacamole is mushy peas. Oh, hey, up! I've never thought of guacamole. There's, there's one. There's one. <laughs> right. This is the, this is the universal question. Now, every single person so far has answered this question. Um, I'm not going to say correctly, but correctly. Um, so, and this one is round or spherical dice. Are they allowed or banned? Banned. Banned. Well done. Keeping up the hundred percent record no requirement for them any anywhere um next on to our second question in, in i also of... ban while you're there i also ban yeah. metal sticks oh have, have to be wooden sticks metal's banned is that for scratching figures that's two reasons i scratches terrain but the only time we've ever come across people getting injured was with, was with metal measuring sticks and tape measures never with a wooden one ah, right, so okay same, we had two injuries with people using um tape measures one got clipped on the side of the head because the other guy had pushed it out too far pulled the release button so it came flying back and clip, clipped it like next to it oh my word that's why always when if you play with me it's always wooden measuring sticks never a metal one in sight ah, that's a good idea and no Did tape any, measure no tape measure nobody dueling uh, with tape measures outside to no. decide um our disagreements on the war games table. Well, they can, but I tell them where the North Sea is, and it's not too far away. <laughs> Disag disagreements, disagreements with tape measures. It's the way forward. Um, so this is the, the the this this is in honour of David Marshall from TM Terrain. I don't know if you know David. Um, I didn't. Yeah, he's uh, his uh, check his terrain out. It's absolutely unreal. Um, he his his question is: You're going down the chippy. Do you go for haddock or cod? Haddock. Haddock. Now, um, a lot of, a lot of war games rules these days are kind of six and you're dead. Do you like a good table in a set of rules, like a casualty table, something like that, or do you prefer the modern style of rules? Uh, casualty table, in a sense, I don't understand. I'm not really sure what you meant by the roll a six and you're dead or you're alive type thing. 
Yeah, so you, you would no. have a handful of dice and sixes in your dead rather than a casualty table where you have numbers of figures against die roll across the top. There's room for both because you go back to your Ingram Manor when you fight a cavalry melee, you roll sixes kill dice, don't depending they? on the numbers and quality. Yeah. Six is, is good and they kill. Yeah. But if, if you like, I don't know, do you remember the Battleground series going back to the mid 70s? Yes, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you go there, when he was using his original in Grand Manor, when he was fighting the guy from the Defence Ministry or whatever it was, mm. he was using a table for the cavalry combats. Ah, ah that's he, interesting. He bemoans the fact that his guard lances have rolled a three on 2d6. <laughs> And his right. opponents rolled 10 on 2d6. So originally they were using a table. Right. That they migrated to dice. Uh, all due to the guard lances losing a melee. Who knows? But I use a completely <laughs> different system anyway. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that shortly, but uh, that's great. Now, you've ch- I think you might have changed your mind on this, this next question. Um, and it's a statement with a yes or no answer. 28 mil is king, yes or no? No. No. Um, only, only four questions to go, and uh, this one is unpainted miniatures. Are they allowed on the table? Yes or no? No, because everything's painted. I have no philosophical reason as to why if someone wanted to and wanted yeah. to put them on. None. Too old to worry about that sort of stuff. <laughs> now, this is a very important question, and you, you probably don't know who I support. So, um, but uh, Bradford City or Leeds United? Bradford City. Oh. Brilliant. Do you want to know uh, why? Go on, because Mike was a big Leeds fan. <laughs> so was Richard Harris. Yes, he is, yeah. <laughs> sad lads. Yeah. And there's another one called Duncan Forrest. Another sad people. Yeah. They'll yeah. get over it eventually. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's uh, when when Richard did this quiz, quiz, that was one of the questions that he got wrong. I mean, we knew he was going to get it wrong from the start. <laughs> it was always going to happen. Always going to happen. Um, You've got to choose Yorkshire or the other place over the hill. Which one do you go for? Yorkshire. Of course. Of course. And final question. Um, games Workshop, are they the work of the devil? Yes or no? Oh, if, if, if I can have a pendulum, it's, it's towards the devil. <laughs> towards the devil. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not nice to say they are the devil. The thing yeah. I don't like with their marketing clout is they're ripping off young kids. The war games fraternity, really, the manufacturers should just get themselves together and form their own little business, whatever you, have, you like, that then recommend things to young youngsters so that they don't get ripped off by, I think, extortionate pricing. Yeah, my, my lad's done a, started doing a bit of GW when he was younger. And I think he's kind of realised now that he, he's obviously seen me game and seeing that the figures I bought 20 years ago are still valid for World War II or Italian Wars or whatever I'm playing, and I don't have to buy new figures every time a new set of rule comes out. The other practice I will say, if this goes out, that I find abhorrent is that yeah. there are potential games put on where people have to turn up with figures from certain manufacturers to be able to play the game. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm very wary of that as well. I think um, I think it's abhorrent it, to, to, yeah. to put impact that onto a, young, onto a younger kid. If he's got mm. the wear for all to come up with figures, paint them, why can't he play? Why, they sends out all the wrong signals to me. Exactly. And I think uh, mine or your table, Jerry. I think they'd be welcome. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So we, we need our own um, international war games figure company and then we can... Certainly do. <laughs> Put the world <laughs> we, right. And then we can retire again. <laughs> yeah, Prime Minister for three weeks. Then we can set all the rules for the work for war games. Yeah, that would be perfect. That would be perfect. Well, you've done extremely well there. Um, you've got 80%, which is one of the highest oh, scores good. going. Um, and I think um, we, we both have a very similar philosophy when it comes to wargaming. So I, I don't think there's there's any surprises there. Um, and um, I'll just have to get... If you were painting, I could get you some proper Yorkshire paintbrushes, you see. That would be the... Uh, that would that would be it. And then we're never going to agree on avocado at the end of the day. No. <laughs> It's caused some problems, is that question. I do like it. Though. Um, so I don't know if you uh, got a chance to have a think about this one. This is um, this is the War Games Room 101. And uh, I don't know if you remember the TV show. Um, no. no, you've not seen it. So George Orwell in 1984 had a room of horror um, called Room 101. And um, the TV show 
Uh, it was on BBC One for quite some time. I think I think it's back on again now. And guests come on and they kind of suggest to the host something that they don't like uh, about a particular subject and uh, try and convince the host that that pet hate of theirs should be banished to the War Games tip. Um, so is there anything in your war gaming history or that's a pet peeve of yours that you think, oh, I'd love to get rid of that if I could? He's, um, <laughs> he's turning up to a game and the guy opposite sort of says, um, can I use your dice as well? Oh. Say, no. 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 I'll, and I'll say there are two reasons. First of all, I went to the expense of buying my own so you can buy your own. And secondly, yeah. these are all my cheating dice, so you can't use them. <laughs> so the, the, the special uh, Jerry Lucky dice uh, are not leaving your hands. Correct. <laughs> Did that in Vienna. I yeah. was slapping, I was, it was next to me, one of Johannes. I was slapping his hand because sometimes he was picking up my dice. Oh. <laughs> Well, I definitely, yeah, I definitely, I can definitely put people using your dice into. I can load that up on my trailer and get that down to the council tip on Saturday, because uh, that is a that is a that is a classic one. Uh, yeah. The guy, the, the the person who doesn't turn up and then starts using your dice, um, and that you always end up with less dice than you started with. They always disappear somewhere. Are you, a youngster, <laughs> fair enough, but a guy just yeah. turns up because he can't be bothered. If he can't be bothered. It's not going to be my problem. It's going to remain your problem. Have you um, have you become a dice addict? I know a number of people buy horrendous amounts of dice. We've got a guy who comes here and he he's nearly up to the stage now where he needs a low loader to bring his um, his dice collection, and then might use ten in a game. Well, I've got about six hundred. Yeah, <laughs> maybe more. <laughs> what I did. Um, Grand is a good one to use because everyone knows Grand Manor. If you've got artillery fire in the battery, normally you have four guns if you're French, six of you're Russian. Mm. You have four, three guns and a howitzer. And you roll D10s. So typically yeah. what people would do is try and find three red dice, a blue dice. So three guns, one howitzer, roll a dice mm. away you go. When you go doing big games, and they used to do it in the hotel until the hotel decided we were the wrong sort of client base, there would be 20 <laughs> players. And yeah. you really want 20 players to have their own set of dice. Hence the numbers. Works so I have, um, I use D6, D8, D10, D12s, mm. and they're in blue, black, red, green, and blue, and white. And is there a, is there a hierarchy of look with those colours? No. No, Some you don't have... Prefer, everyone prefers their own different colours. So if, for example, they might use red and black for the artillery dice, blue for the skirmisher dice, green yeah. for morale dice, Whatever they want to do. I, I have I have I have black dice to start with, and if they don't work, I bring in my orange dice. And if my orange dice don't work, I go purple. See, I'm getting more royal as I go along. And then finally, if they don't work, I've got a set of gold Lame dice that even I can't tell what the numbers are on the top of them, so it doesn't really matter what they are. I think we're all strange dice people at the end of the day. Um, so thank you very much for taking part in the quiz in Room 101, Jerry, and we'll be back in a second, and we're going to talk about your current war gaming. So we're back with our final section, and uh, this is normally our big topic section, but we've kind of got two two big topics with Jerry, and uh, we've talked about the War Games Holiday Centre, and um, your War Gaming's moved on from there, and uh, we're in the the Situation Room now, um, and uh, what what was the what was the, the sort of the story between the end of the War Games Holiday Centre and your, your current situation now? It was just deciding what. What, what, what did I want to do? Sat down with my wife, Anne. She said, mm. the money's there. What should we do? And the rest of it said, okay, let's see if we can raise a bit more money ourselves and we'll do our own building. But we won't do it as a business. We'll just do it for all the people who've come who we've known for years, make it social. Should be more fun, more relaxed. We're doing our own thing, beholding to nobody. And you decided um, very early on that you were going to record this in, in, in your blog, your um situation room blog 
the, the full story is there. You can you can see your garden, you can see it being dug up, and you can see everything going in. What was what was the the kind of what made you decide to do that? It's just a way of recording it. I actually started off by creating an Excel file to list all of what I thought the expenditure might be, and then that very quickly came into what the expenditure actually was. So right. I recorded everything down, even down to postage stamps. Yeah. So I still got the running total of everything that's spent, with whom, why? Because originally I was using it as a planning tool, and then very soon I could use it as a historical tool and do it that way. And that's where the blog came in. So I thought, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to record it because I'm, I'm going to show people. 28 millimeters a, a great scale and the rest of it, and mm. with 10 millimeters you can do different things, mm. and it all has brings imparts a different feeling to it. So without a doubt, all of the experienced Grand Manor players and 28s who come here, the first thing they say when they see the armies on the table is they look like proper armies because it's as if they've been taken up to 2,000 feet to look down on it. They, they look like proper armies. You can, see whole, you can see whole corps moving to do whatever they're going to do. So that's yeah. the first thing they say. Was that your first ever sort of journey into blogging and that sort yeah. of thing? You'd not done it before with the holidays? Never done it before. It was only um, a year ago. We got a smartphone. <laughs> well, I'm in, I'm impressed at you. You're doing the you're doing the Zoom thing. Um, I had to I had to get in my car and go and visit Pete Morby because he he couldn't he couldn't work internet links and stuff. Bless him. So um, I went down and sat in his in his workshop and we had a little microphone between us, which was at the end of the day it was lovely. It was great to go and see him in his workplace. Um, I'll take so... the mic out of him now. All you have to do is follow the all you have to do is follow the instructions. Oh yeah, well, I, I I don't even know if he's got a computer, bless him. But uh, um, it, yeah, he's got one. Yeah, but he must have frauds and stuff, mustn't he? Or maybe oh. somebody somebody else will do it. He'll have somebody. Else. He'll have a minion who will do that for him. <laughs> so when you came to when you came to design the Situation Room, then what was your what was your thoughts? What was your in your mind? Did you have specific specs that you were going to work towards? Initially, I thought it was going to be timber. Because I think that I thought that was the simplest and cheapest way of doing it, mm. and then there's too many, too many issues with that. And then I came from the idea of um, a garage. So my garage, I've forgotten Mike's one, but my actual garage, which is an old garage, is made from a company called Liggett, which is near Birmingham, I believe, Staffordshire, somewhere around there. And it, all it is is just um, sectional concrete put together. Right. Yeah. I contacted them and they said, yeah, we can do it. Um, I don't think they realised exactly what they were getting into in the sense of it. But anyway, um, that's it's, it's a modular, it's built modular in concrete that way. The size of it was down to the space I could fit in the gardens because I tend to do things lawfully, so I don't break planning rules. Mm. Uh, I use building regs for the building, check yeah. I didn't need planning. So that's set the out sort of the footprint and then it was done properly with foundations and all this sort of stuff so that set the size that's how was that done and then got it insulated so that was done properly rather than freeze your toes off and yeah. curl your fingers and then the t next bit was the table design i decided the first thing was um, my neighbor designed the tables i told him what i wanted and he designed them um for the tables which gives me immense amount of storage they're all based on four befores. I have a, each table is 24 foot long. Yeah. The main support struts are four before connected to a single piece of tubular steel that runs the whole length of the table. Just so happens that tubular steel comes in standard lengths of 24 foot six inches. Ah, uh, that's handy. <laughs> so cut the six inches off the end, and that's what you've got. And it just so happens John next door, my neighbour, who did all the work, who's in his he won't mind me saying it, he's in his so mid-70s. He has all the tools, the angle grinders, the welders, the lot. Mm. And there he was, 3rd of January, in there, sawing away, <laughs> making it for me. Yeah. He loves doing that type of thing. So he, he made all of that uh, for the tables. So that's how the tables. And mm. then how the terrain is done, very quickly became apparent that the, the tables are just plain green painted plain mm. green and all terrain that is to do with grass or anything like that is plain green no different color there's no shading yeah uh, the only things that get shaded or dry brushed are things like roads and mm. then the villages 
and that's how you generate the effect you see when you get there but yeah and then also cost is a, is a thing and time so the table tops is although they're 24 mm. foot long by six foot that's mm. just two pieces of mdf 12 foot by six foot one inch thick no no warping issues when they're an inch thick not when john's finished with them no <laughs> perfect and what's the table layout in the in terms of what it's 24 foot by six foot and then two yep. 24 foot by three foot sorry 24 foot by two foot so it's a, it's similar to the war games holiday center and you've got like the reinforcement tables at the end i like to call them and then the two main like fighting the yeah and then the two main yeah. fighting tables if you like yeah. in, in, the, in the middle and what's the gap between those uh, three foot three foot so enough for uh, a reasonably large gentleman to get through if required and that's why it was purposely designed to do it that way and yeah. you've seen a, a lot of people have um steps that you stand on so you can lean further into the table well one of the wall gamers graham uh, he's coming again on sunday he was the template so what we did is we worked out how far he had to lean over yeah and then john yeah. my next door neighbor made the three benches that you could stand on ah perfect and they're, they're stored outside when not in use in what we call a coffin <laughs> right. So I've run out of space inside. Have you already? Virtually, yeah. Oh, underneath, wow. underneath each table, there are two layers for storage. Each, each fully lined out with um, or mica top board, and one twenty-four foot by six is completely chopper block with nothing but figures. Wow. The other smaller ones, they're all terrain pieces underneath, and the other ones start to get used up. But we leave that one free so when they're taking the figures out for the game they can put the trays underneath rather than put the trays back in the slot oh because oh, everything's stored and slotted correctly fields all the fields have their own slots they're all stored so the storage is done nothing what professionally done it sounds absolutely superb um yeah. so we yeah we, we talked we talked we've talked briefly about this and around it a couple of times but the, the 10 mil decision then how quickly and, and how did you come to that decision having been 28 mil very thing? quickly for 10 mil simply because it was uh, i knew how long it took to build up the figures that were in a war games holiday center how could i do that in 28 and the answer is no because first of all i won't be able to find the painters for a kickoff yeah and it would be too extortionate so that was one category then 10 mil how do i do that uh painters was still the main issue uh yeah. Michael Neil, Neil Keneally came to the rescue on that so that's how that came about in terms of 10 mil and then it was stuttering and about figures so I thought well I want the same sort of footprint for a battalion as mm. 28 yeah I'm going to look odd if I use the same number of 10 mil so why don't I use more <laughs> figures yeah. so I arbitrarily started at three times the number it was an arbitrary number mm. to begin mm. with then I realised if I did that, I could actually use proper characteristics and go to three rank lines. So, so all of the European armies are in three rank lines, except for the Brits, and they're in two rank lines. So I could mm. or immediately I could incorporate that into it. Then I found out that within the rules, that the in terms of the firing tables, there wasn't a problem for the infantry. But there was from the artillery, because I've gone gun for gun. Right. Okay uh so i got that sorted out and that was easily done and then the biggest one initially when we started playing games we were using the old cavalry rules from in the ground manner yeah and then we went to a different set which is a is a couple of sets of rules that that work on the basis of difference between combat ability they separate mm. combat ability to numbers they separate the two mm. issues out yeah you could be a better quality unit you can win the melee but still lose more men and it divorced it so i start i did divorce that and i did the same on the infantry and the artillery i divorced the classes of troops with the numbers of troops so mm. i have now eight classes but you can then mix them so you could have someone who's got an elite morale but you could give them the roster sheet for a militia battalion so they're very brittle or you can make them very poor morale but you could give them they'll keep coming back because you're giving them the boxes to go with say a guard unit but the two mm. extremes you can actually use and it's just started slotting into place and building up and building up and building up but for example neil Keneally could never have done it without him uh i was in hot to him for about nine grand at one time and he 
And he his only stipulation was, because I was paying monthly, his only stipulation was that I managed the paperwork. That was it. That was it. So each month, put money into his account, send in the yeah. updated extra fight. That's all he wanted. Yeah. So that was very good of him. And then a number of people have invested in me. Uh, quite a lot of money between them. Mm. Herbert the Austrian, little Graham, Gordon. A uh, number of war gamers is like Paul. He's painted now 20 battalions, not mm. a penny. Some of them are just doing it because they want to play here and they want to see this keep going. But they've got the same view I've got. So I just mm. keep getting more and more figures. And they say, well, oh, I'll paint them then. I'll paint them. Because they want to play. <laughs> and we have a good game. We have beer. We go out for meals. Perfect. And we're all friends. Perfect. And do you have a preferred uh, figure manufacturer? Uh, for, 10 Dragon for 10 mil. I was going to say that's the only kind of one that I'm, I'm aware of. It's a nice stocky figure that doesn't go anywhere and I get a discount. Well, we, we like a discount, we, we, we don't worry. Well, we work, we work together. I mean, he got yeah. ripped off by one guy, but we work together. I'll say, so like the French mm. guard and the Umdenard, they said, let's get the French guard. And I want about, I don't know, French guard, it's 5,000 figures. So he does it. Because he knows yeah. it's paying for, I'm I'm paying for the design work because it's done and dusted. So that's what yeah. we've done now. Because all the big stuff's been broken, I'm doing the little stuff. So I'm now doing limbers and caissons. So I've actually, I've actually got the French one designed and done, which he's got. And I've now just got the Prussian one back, mm. which he's now got. I've got the Russian one left to do. And he's got the Austrian and the Brit. Because my next mega, mega, mega maniac thing is to actually do the limber teams with the harnesses between the horses as well on on the limber. I've worked out the fuse wire to do it with. Oh, hey, oh. <laughs> that's going to look. Oh, well, that will look brilliant. And and do you uh, is it like a base behind the, the the laid out battery? What you would do, you'd take the battery, and the limber will be the size of the battery. Right. Same footprint. And that's how you, that's how I'm going to do it. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And uh, how long did it take you to then to get a collection together enough for, to start gaming? Well, it was World War Two. So the first, the hole was dug in the garden in August 2010, and the first game was Easter 2011. Wow, so that's that was World World War Two Eastern Front. And everything we had, which. As it turns out, it's not, nothing compared to what we've got now. <laughs> uh, and the first Napoleonic, I think, was December 2012. Go on. No, so go on. You say. Uh, and that was using the new rules apart from the cavalry. For the cavalry, we mm. were using the old rules. And so we, I, I, I picked a peninsula again because it made it mm. simpler to do that because most of it tends to be like cavalry with a sprinkling of heavies. And, and and you say you, you you're nearly there with Napoleonics now. Have you you've collected? Have you got enough for most of the big battles, or are you still? Yeah, really... but it's never never stopped. And again, for, for personal reasons or something, like that, the rest of it is now more or less certain that we'll get the Portuguese armies and Spanish armies. So there's another twenty thousand figures. I suppose I think that's the problem with Napoleonics. Is it you can once you once you've entered the room, you, you struggle to get out of it because there's just so much stuff you can get. But it's lots of lots lots of the friends that have come, they're into it. They're either helping source the figures, mm. get the figures. I've got mm. some of them doing the research on the fit on on the period, and and some of them even painting. Collective collective effort. That's what we like to see. That's, that's what, what we works. like to see. Well, well, we have a great time, and it's an open door. Anyone can come along and have a pop and say, oh, can I have a look? Yeah, come and have a look. Brilliant. So what um, what rules do you use for World War II? My rules. Your rules. Always the best ones. Always the best ones. Yes. They, they migrated from command decision. Where he went wrong, he, he pandered to the American market that decided that uh, rather than any level of paperwork, we'll go down the route that says, I, although I've killed it, there's now a saving throw. So you've gone down the route of backtracking to get, try and get rid of paperwork i i haven't i see nothing wrong with paperwork providing it's not reams and reams of it and providing yeah. it's done so you can put it all nicely together and it's easy to access so that's where it was sourced from um then it's got my sort of view and bent on it to, to simplify it out to some extent things like order systems are always a problem 
I can't uh, command a decision without things like arrows. You'd have a you'd have a, a, a chitty that you put down a unit that had a command element, full move or a half move. And if you did a half move, you could fire in two phases, a full move, one phase. So we still use a similar system, but it's it's been streamlined over years and years and years and mm. years of play. And it's they're the rules that we used to use at the War Game Solidity Centre, and it's designed for fighting um, divisional size battles. Mm. Yeah. Because those those no. little order chits, um, Johnny Reb, the American Civil War system is is one that I play that uses those chits, um, and it's quite it's quite a good way of, um, of sorting out orders and stuff, isn't it? Um, it seems to work quite well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to. I mean, like in Fire and Fury, we changed the order. We actually well, we changed the order system because theirs, frankly, doesn't work properly. And that's why. I can't say this for absolute certain, but there are certain things we did in certainly in the War Games Holiday Centre and then subsequently in the Situation Room, which I've seen migrate into updated versions of rules that have been going for a few years. So yeah. stuff that I've been using but for 12 years, I've suddenly seen... In another set. <laughs> in, 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 but it's the same set. So I've, without, you know, I, I, I've definitely seen that. Yeah, you're a trail bro- trailblazer without without. No, being not aware. really. It's just the, the key. The key advantage you get if you want to write rules is that you're not playing with the same people all the time. So over the 17 mm. years, I had all sorts of people coming in. So when you try different things or you use a set of rules, you saw how all these people got on with them, and yeah. you saw that yeah. even Grandman is a good example. 80 percent of it's fine, not a problem. Everyone gets it, there's, but there's this bits where the they're not sure they interpret it different things. So when the rules were written in 2001, all of that was brought mm. into the main fold. So that we we actually wrote down virtually all the things at the time we could think of. Yeah. You never do think of everything, but we did we brought together and tied it up all these things. So there was no doubt as to which way you were mm. supposed to do it for that current set of rules. Um that's what you, you, you but you get that benefit when you see disparate people from all over the place playing rules and you see what they're doing and what they're not doing. Disadvantage when you play with a group is great, but you only get the experience from the group. And so you yeah. become like-minded with each other. And you all agree that that's the way to do it and therefore that's how you do it. So is um, World War II Napoleonic, any plans to go outside of those two periods at the moment? Or are you, I'll take it it's no. plenty to go on those two. No, that's it. Um, no. Um, there's a friend, Gordon, he does 15 mil, so he's got the whole Gettysburg armies all painted, they stored here. That's had one outing. So, but no, no plans to go elsewhere. It takes too much time, effort and money. And do you find that staying with one scale, it makes terrain easier because you, you, you're buying terrain in one scale because a Napoleonic wood is a World War II wood at the end of the day, isn't it? Yes, and it means, yes, as you say, I think I've got... Uh, is it, I think it's MKM, the company. But anyway, the trees I've got, I've got about a thousand trees and it's all from the same place. He did, he based them the way I wanted them, which was great and easier for him. Mm. Uh, when I buy terrain, which I don't do now because it's the guy, one guy from Birmingham, he used to do uh, low, low temperature resin cast buildings, I think, but he subsequently died. Shuka, John Shuka was his name. Forgotten the company name he had. Uh, but I got a lot of buildings off him from Napoleonics, which I commissioned off him. Yeah. So because the buildings, uh, you need the right footprint. It tends to be uh, squash the roof slightly, and it makes it look right with 10 mil. You do the same with 20 mil. So if you go to the War Games Solidity Centre, you'll find that all the villages are 20 mil scale. Mm. But it looks okay for 28 mil figures. Yeah. When you go to a 28 mil scale building, of which there are some down there, especially uh, of um, some Ligny buildings, mm. there's one called On Bass, which is a copy of it. Um, it looks a different, completely different scale when you put it on the table. So mm. yes, but it's easier to do the scaling to keep it all at one. But, but I don't use my World War II buildings for Napoleonics. They, they, they don't look right. But your trees and roads and stuff. Trees, roads, yeah. rivers, streams, you name it, yes. In, interchangeable perfect interchangeable. yeah you've kept your blog going um after the initial build and you and you you're recording your games on there um is, is it kind of one game a month or every weekend or normally you do? no normally it's one a month 
have you got a preference for Napoleonics or World War Two? Napoleonics. Still, still Napoleonics. But I'll, but I'll keep fitting in the odd World War Two because there's possibly one or two gamers who might prefer that. But yeah, everybody likes it. It's it's different. It's a change. So just 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 before we finish off, then um, we've been going for nearly a couple of hours now, um, which is uh, normal for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We've got. I've gone four hours now once, uh, so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, so, uh, just going to finish off with a couple of things for, for, from you as kind of um, suggestions, if you like, um, to people who are running games. Um, and the first one is: is a lot of people use points to kind of equalise a game. Um, and we discussed earlier on that you're not really a points kind of guy, and neither am I. Um, so, how? How do you deal with those one-sided battles that obviously history creates um, that we like to do on the table? If you're going to fight a one-sided battle because you know it's a one-sided battle, then mm. you, you do one or two things. You either leverage it some way so the game will last the amount of time it's supposed to last. Mm. And you just set a victory condition is that if the side is being pummeled is still alive, then they've won. Yep. Um, that's one thing you try and do. And the second thing you do is try just try and make sure if you know the players and you know their experience levels, that yeah. you don't yeah. unbalance it in any way or form. I'm trying to think of a, a battle off the top of my head where it's a foregone conclusion. Some of the early Napoleonic ones? Where... It's not the early Napoleonic ones. It's where you have Napoleonic and you have Spanish. Yeah. Spanish are very, Spanish are very brittle. Mm. So what you tend to do when you've got that, there are some players... Who are experienced who mm. would want to play Spanish because it's a challenge. Oh, and right. That yeah, works, yeah. And that yeah. works out great because they know they're slightly under the cost to begin with. Yeah. Because they're, it's a brittle army, mm. but it's down to their skill level and a bit of luck to try and maximize it. Mm. And then the opposing side, the French, quite often they have the quandary well, how much do I throw against the Spanish? They're yeah. supposed to be brittle. And then they find out they don't throw enough against the Spanish. The guy who actually knows what he's doing, yeah. he's doing this sort of sort of going to be the tail wagging the dog if you're not careful. <laughs> um, so you, you you mix that and then you balance it sometimes with victory conditions. But having said that, it's been my experience with the big games is that when someone says on a Sunday afternoon who's won the game, you just say mm. to everybody, stand back from the table, you say, look at the table, and you say, well, who's won? Yeah, and it's obvious. It is obvious who's won, That's and you can compare that. it. You know, they like comparing it. How good a victory is it compared to what happened historically, or that type yeah. of thing? Brilliant. But normally, you just stand back and look at it and say it's obvious. And finally, then, um, are there any? As we said, as I said right at the start of the show, one of the reasons I started this um, podcast was to bring big games back into into. The, the public eye and there are still loads of people like yourself and and us here and and richard at uh, his place doing big games but it seems to be kind of hidden in sheds throughout the country um if somebody new to gaming wanted to get involved in big gaming what kind of things or recommendations or tips could you give them to to get into that you got to find like-minded people because unless you're lucky enough to bump into somebody who already knows somebody and let's say you're just doing yourself. And this is this is a good thing about the Austrians. It's a good example. Um, with Herb, as I said, before she passed away, but his friend France. Now, France was telling me he met Herbert in 1988, I think, because they were board mm. gamers. Yeah. And he said it was four years or five years before Herbert showed him some figures. And then he saw these figures, and France is all, why are you prattling about on a board with little stickers <laughs> moving? You know, we've got figures. And then there must have been another friend, Stefan, and then I think two others, possibly a guy called Christoph and Anatol. And so they got together and decided to get the figures. Then they decided to lease their own place. And that's what they did. So rather than one person having to do all of it, mm. because there are, there are two guys in the UK, quite private individuals who have huge setups bigger than anybody else's that exist mm. um, and resources to match. Yeah. But I know them, so I, I, I potentially can get an invite to go down. Yeah. So I think sometimes it's like-minded people meeting together and starting off maybe with the six before, and then deciding, have I really into it? Do I have the disposable income? Do I have the time and the money with family, other 
commitments and then try and go down that potential route actually mm. hire somewhere out that you can rent so ah i can rent this this room somewhere so that's what leads you you guys do you still do yeah yeah one of the Leeds yeah. clubs is it pudsey they they still rent somewhere they can go on a saturday morning and have a, whatever it is another bigger game well we yeah we're, we're lucky well lucky lucky in some ways in the, the Leeds club now the one that you know through richard and and um, andy and all that lot who came to the club who came to the holiday center is that um one of the members um, sadly passed away brian um but he left his a lot of money in his will to the club um so we've now bought a permanent um clubhouse so we can leave stuff up there all the time for for as, as long as we as long as we want which is absolutely it's getting light and minded people this is through tragedy but they might be able to get together mm -hmm. and say well i can put in two grand three even if they can rent it for two years or something and decide in that time did they want to find more money to make it more permanent or whatever mm -hmm. that's the way i think for big gaming you're gonna have to do it if you want to get it done that way excellent well i'd love to see more people get into the big side of gaming because it is as we both know um by far the best <laughs> But the manufacturers can help themselves because if they decide that they want to put on a game, uh, if they got together and said to people what they know that put games on because they like doing it, like instead of having a, a 12 by 6, can you, can you have a, a 24 by 6? Yeah. Facilitate it for them at the shows to be able to put it on. And mm. then there's an incentive to use their figures, you know, all mm. sorts of incentive. And, and it's the bigger game that's going to be striking with the guy going around saying, oh, oh, look at that, look at the side of that. Yeah, and I, th I think that was one one of the things that I've mentioned before is that I went to Northern Military, similar to yourself, and I remember walking in and seeing a huge Napoleonic game, and I would have only, you know, I would have been early teens, uh, and just pointing at it and going, "That's what I want to do, that, that over there," and then not being afraid of the work that it takes to get yeah. from having an empty hand to get there. I mean, the triples is another one, but that died a death. Yeah, um, that's true. It, and the World Championships. Again, they've got a venue where everything's big enough, but mm. no, but the manufacturers don't get together to grasp it and say, you know, because it's a huge hangar. And here's a table, it's 48 foot long and it's 12 foot deep, and we're doing yeah. this. Because we they've got together with three guys who want to put on a demo game, they have the collections, they put it together. And then the companies say, Well, we'll put you up there overnight. So you you create something that someone's gonna see. And as you say, they're gonna turn up and say, Crikey, I want to get involved. How do I do that? Where do I go? What do I do? Yeah, here's my money. <laughs> here's my money. <laughs> Always here's my money. Always here's my money. Well, it's been lovely talking to you, Jerry. Um, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Um, I oh. always end. Uh, I, I always end by say asking the uh, the guest to ask me a question if they've got one. You don't have to. I haven't really got one. Oh, that's no problem at all. Can I go home? That's usually the one that I get. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to have to get a beer now. Oh, brilliant. Well, it's been it's an absolute... It's four o'clock. It is, it is. It must be beer time. I'm going, to get, I'm, a... going to, I'm going to get the Pringles and a beer. Oh, I don't blame you, mate. Well, um, oh, it's I, been... I, I, can, I can now, happily, because my wife, man, she retired on Monday, so that's okay. Oh, did she? Oh, um, well, wish her, the, wish her the best from me, then. That's fantastic. Yeah. 40 years in the NHS. Oh, well, it deserves a beer, then. Definitely deserves yeah. a beer. Goes back part-time <laughs> in March. Oh well, there we go. There we go. Some 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 people enjoy the the care inside of it, don't they? So yeah, and if you get down there, you're gonna to have to pop in. I mean, you must get down this part of the world to do something. Yeah, I I work in North Yorkshire, so I've probably been past the end of your driveway a few times. Well, you know where it is, don't you? Uh, roughly, yeah, I can vaguely remember. Yeah, Pope Pope to, yeah, yeah. Go yeah. on. I, I, that was that would be lovely. Thank you very much for that. No problem whatsoever. And thanks for well, having me. Hey, no, it's been it's been an absolute joy, and um, you, as I said at the start, you, you're kind of one of the the war games big game people who I, I really really wanted to get on this show. So I'm so glad that you've done it. So uh, if you just want to say if you want to say good night to everyone, Jerry. Good night, everyone. Thanks for listening. I'm I'm glad I behaved myself. No swear words. Quite unusual for me. It's quite unusual so... for this show as well. So <laughs> 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 thanks, Jerry. Good night, everyone.
Thanks very much, Jerry, for spending the time to talk to me. It was a lovely interview. Um, I haven't seen Jerry for 20 odd years, so that was uh, it was great to have a catch up with him and uh, see how things have progressed since um, he left the War Games Holiday Centre and what a cracking setup he's got now. Um, if you haven't had a look at Jerry's website, I urge you to do so. Uh, the Situation Room, I will put a link to the website in both the show notes on Podbean and also on uh, the YouTube version when that comes out. So check that out. Have a look at what Jerry's up to today. Um, it really is big wargaming. Um, really well done. I know he's been... Um, having a game for the last week with uh, lots of uh, guys whose uh, names you might may recognize from from this podcast and previous ones and uh, I think they've had a fantastic week looking at the pictures and uh, I look forward to getting some more big game names on here in the future names that you've heard on here people like Doug Mason uh, Andy Cube with his uh, sent over in Vienna Dave Doherty, they're all names on my list and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get some more of those on the show in the future next episode um, out hopefully second or third uh, Friday in March uh, will be with Simon Miller and uh, many of you will know Simon he is a big game proponent and uh, he's got some fantastic sets of figures uh, he's been involved with Mark Freeth with a few uh, things down at the War Games Holiday Centre with uh, lots of big ancient uh, stuff and uh, he was at Partizan last year with uh, a big and I mean big because they were about 60 or 70 mil figures um, he did an ancient game uh, there he's uh, best known as a rule writer with uh, things like To the Strongest and uh, he's working on sets for the Renaissance I believe so that's going to be a- another lovely chat I'm looking forward to that talking to Simon uh, next month so until then um, fingers crossed for the uh, awards for the Caesars uh, which are in late March so we'll probably get another episode in before the results come out uh, but fingers crossed for that it's uh, judged by a panel I believe um, so uh, there's, there's, there's no opportunity to vote for me in that but to do bob along to the Caesar Awards website uh, there's an opportunity to um, vote for the best uh, YouTube channel uh, best overall channel and uh, our friend from Brews in the Binyard Alex Sutherland from Storm of Steel on there so I'm not going to try and sway your vote in any way shape or form but just go down and vote for Alex will you Uh, that'd be brilliant so um, me and Alex will be representing Yorkshire in the Caesar Awards um, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll do very well well Alex will anyway Uh, thanks for listening and uh, I'll see you in a month's time see you